For those of you that just came in, um, if you need CEUs, there's a sign-up sheet there in the back. This, this particular talks today are on nutrient management, which are usually ones that the CCAs have a hard time getting. So this is nutrient management, a full unit in nutrient management today. I'd also advise if you have not, or if you have a commercial pesticide applicator's license for several of the states, you can sign up the sheets up there by the, by the uh, desk so you don't have to go sit in class. I'm not, I had not sat in a classroom in 50 years. I don't intend to do it again. So uh, mine expires in about two months. So I'm trying to make sure that I don't have to go sit in a class. I probably couldn't pass the test now. But, but demonstration is a whole lot easier than commercial. So. We're about, by my watch, we're getting pretty close to time to get started. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Wayne Evil here. Uh, I apologize, you just gonna have to bear with me. I'm talking the best I can today, which is better than it was yesterday. Uh, thank goodness it's a small room. If I tried to project, I probably couldn't project to you in the back corner. But uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear today. With me today is Chico Williams. Chico is a uh, uh, was a rice farmer. He is now a cotton and soybean farmer in the Mississippi Delta. One of the first farms I worked on in 1981 was his grandfather's farm. Uh, 1981. I've been with Mississippi State University since 1980, and I started out as a cotton rice researcher, and I had never seen either one of those crops before <laughs> in my life. I came from uh, the University of Kentucky and the University of Illinois. You put butter and sugar on rice and you eat it as dessert and uh, other pieces of uh, clothing, usually non-mentionable, are cotton. So other than that, I have worked on many, many, many crops over the years, including uh, medicinal plants and herbs. I've worked on uh, energy beets, sesame, black mustard, yellow mustard, coriander, all kinds of stuff. But my responsibility is now is in cotton, corn, and soybeans. So I've spent, and a, a lot of my work is in crop rotation. I've done a lot of work with crop rotation over the years. And uh, when you've been around as long as I have, you can afford to work on crop rotation. Uh, the centennial rotation, which I'll be talking nothing about today, but I will next week in another meeting, I established in, in 2004 to commemorate the centennial anniversary of the experiment station at Stoneville. It is a planned 100 year project and I do not plan to harvest the 100th crop, but it is planned for that. So with that, uh, some of the work that I'll be talking about today has been sponsored over the years by the, the Corn Promotion Board in Mississippi. Uh, we really appreciate that opportunity, but it's mostly in cooperation with Mississippi State University and the Mississippi Agricultural and Forestry Experiment Station. One of the reasons that I really got interested, um, some of the very first work I did in corn was looking at nitrogen and potassium on corn, but I bootlegged it on some cotton work that I was doing on nitrogen and potassium. And I wanted to look, on well, my very first days looking at the effects of rotation. The literature is full of information about corn does better behind soybeans than corn behind corn. And soybeans does better behind corn than it does behind soybeans. And that's that's common knowledge. But if you look at if you take a look at this field, you see very three very distinct regions. There's a very distinct line, there's a very distinct line. These two fields right here. The only difference with, and there's a hundred plots out there. There's, a, there's five replications, four ni uh, five nitrogen rates and four potassium rates. But the only difference between those two years, they're planted the same day on the same soil type and are managed the same. But you see a very, very distinct line right there. Well, that very distinct line in the, the end of the season, when you average across all those hundred plots, you see a yield difference here 
of 229.5 pounds of cotton per acre per year. So that's what really has pushed me into the crop rotation areas. But that's really not what this talk is about. But I wanted to show you that because of my interest in crop rotation. And some of the things you can do in tough times to increase yield and not increase inputs. So uh, just to give you an idea of where we've been in, in Mississippi, um, like I say, I came in 1980. My first crop was in 1981. This is cotton acres or corn acres harvested in Mississippi. In uh, 1981, we were down maybe a little over 100,000 acres. Uh, by the time we hit up here into the 2000s, we were up at almost a half a million acres. Now, what's happened to yield in that time frame? Well, we had a big jump there in 2006. We went from 330,000 acres to 900,000 acres, and cotton fell from 1.2 down to 300,000. But what's happened to yield in that time frame? We basically, this year, this past year, when we had a pretty tough year, but we still averaged 188 bushels per acre. Last year was our record yield of 189. So we're averaging about three and a half bushels per acre per year for the, almost the last 40 years. Now, I came to work in 1981. I take full credit for that. Nobody can dispute that. I'm the corn research guy. Who's going to argue with me? I've been around longer than anybody. I, I got this gray hair for a reason. So, but just, you know, we have seen a lot of changes in corn production. You know, the question a lot of people had was, you know, can we make 250 to 300 bushel corn yield? Well, yes, we can. Can we do it consistently? No, we can't. There's a little thing, was well, a little person, and she's not really that small. Her name was Mother Nature. And if you can tell me what Mother Nature is going to do for you this year, I can tell you how to grow your crop, how to make a fortune at it. Unfortunately, I just don't have that much influence with Mother Nature. In fact, I don't have any influence with Mother Nature. But we do have the potential. And we have on Farmer's Field, on some work with one of my very first twin row yields, we made 284 bushel of corn, twin row. And that's in half acre plots, big fields, 50 acre field. And that was great. So, you know, what, what can we do to increase yield? Well, there's a couple possibilities. People always want to, if a little bit's good, add a little bit more. Okay. So, nitrogen and irrigation. We use nitrogen. We, you know, the more food you give it, the better it'll be, right? Not necessarily. What happens if you eat too much? You might get sick. You might lose weight. And cotton, that's definitely a possibility, but, you know, um, increasing seeding rates. You know, when I came to Mississippi, we were growing corn at 16,000 plants per acre, non-irrigated, 16,000. Where are we today? At least twice that. At least twice that today. So what happens if you get too high on a plant population? Well, you can get lodging. You don't get very big stocks, you can get lodging. Or you can get barren plants. A barren plant, weed weed no income off of a weed okay what what else can we do can we narrow the rows the midwest is in 30 now they're going down to 20 going down to 15 inch rows so can we do that in the south we're on beds how how much can you put a bed how close can you put a bed we tried going down to 30 inch beds on cotton didn't work very good that bed sloughs off and it's hard to keep a cotton root up out of the moisture so you know, they haven't been very successful. You know, we get too close with the tractor tires. You know, you put a 24-inch tractor in a 30-inch bed, you ain't got much space between it. So, um, you know, spoon-feeding nitrogen, foliar applications. I was told when I first came to Stonewall by a man who had been there a long time from Arkansas, he told me, Mr. Isperger, he said, uh, if a plant was meant to take up nutrients through the leaves, they'd put the roots up there. A lot, of, a lot of information there. I said, okay, I believe that. So, you know, usually split application, anything you do is usually more expensive because it's going to cost you more to do it, more trips across the field. I've done quite a bit of work with pre tassel nitrogen. I don't, it is a possibility. I don't necessarily recommend it. I would rather be right to start with. But it does help if you get into a situation. As I mentioned earlier, I work with 
nitrogen rates and seeding rates in twin row. We looked at the Walker family as actually the Stobel Pedigree Seed Company originators. That's the family that founded that farm. This is some corn work that I did there. This is in 2006. We planted the crop in 2005. The first year of research on their place, there's a little storm came through called Katrina, followed by Rita, that uh, eliminated harvest that year. But one of the things that's interesting to look at, okay, this is, if you look, this is 24,000 plants, 30,000, 33, 35, and 40,000. But the thing that you'll notice, if you average across the nitrogen rates, now we've got a significant response to both nitrogen and seeding rates, but we're seeing a, an increase of about 50 bushel per acre by going from 24,000 to going 40,000 plants per acre. That's a huge increase in that as we increase the seeding rate. Uh, this is the, that same thing again, but you know we're at 272 bushel in 2006. That's averaged across several replications. Now this is in a farmer field. Big plots, half acre size plots. Um, this is, but the question kept coming up, okay, you know, I don't want to spend that extra money on that twin row planter. So, you know, how do I compare single rows versus twin rows? So we've done work on that. This is some work, some variety work that we, that was at Stonewall where we're actually looking at single row versus twin rows. You know, certain variety like the Pioneer 1319, we saw a pretty good advantage to twin row. That's almost a 20 bushel difference just in a variety by going from single row to twin row. Twin row keeping everything else the same. Um, with, with 1739 and 1745, no difference. 2089, no difference. You see differences in the yields themselves, but no difference that year between single row and twin rows. Uh, this is some work, same varieties, looking at the nitrogen rates. Some of them you see a lot of response, some of them you don't see much. But again, we're looking at yields in here, 240, 45 bushels per acre. That's pretty good corn yields. But we do see varietal differences out there. So, you know, that's one of the things we know that those varieties are different, so we want we want the best variety, so that's why you don't want to, to be locked in. Well, the next thing you see, okay, Delft Farm Press, Southeastern Farm Press, Georgia Farmer makes 450 bushel corn. Okay, he's been here before, I'm not going to mention names. The question he fails to answer most time, how'd you do on your whole farm? No answer. Did you make any money? No answer. But he made 450 bushel corn. I was on the first farm in the 1970s that made 300 plus bushel. He put on the soil test potassium was four times recommended levels. Soil test phosphorus was four times recommended level. The thing that brought his yield was water. He had all the nutrients. He was put on micronutrients, everything. But he also had organic matter of 4%. Now, you know, who was the first guy to top 350? Guy on sand in Michigan, Roy Lynn, 351 bushels on sand. Okay, now the question comes, you know, we, we, we never did successfully hit 300, but can we hit 400? Well, um, maybe, maybe not. So some of the work we've got going on right now, you know, you saw that slide where we went up to 40,000 and it kept going up. Well, can we keep going higher? So we've got some studies right now at Stonewall. It's in its uh, second, third, we'll be third year this year. We've got nitrogen rates from 240, which is our low rate, up to 320 pounds a hand per acre. Now that's quite a bit of money invested in that. We put it out 120 pounds early, followed by a side dress, another 120 pounds. So we got 240 pounds on it. Well, let's put a little more out there. Okay. So I go out when I can barely get across the field, put out another 40 pounds. Then I come back at pre-tassel, I put on another 40 pounds. Now I got 320 pounds of nitrogen out there. 320 pounds. Okay. Now I'm using either UAN solution or, or, or urea. <coughs> uh, the urea, I call this my simulated aerial application. <coughs> or take a little cedar. I simulated. A farmer does it with an airplane. On my plots, I don't use an airplane. It's kind of hard to hit that plant. But we're looking at plant populations from 25,000 up to 65,000 plants per acre. That's an awful lot of seed. And when you calculate a 
take a three hundred dollar bag or a four hundred dollar bag of seed, it don't it's not hard to figure out. But that you're looking at three hundred and twenty pounds of nitrogen and six hundred and fifty thousand, you're looking at three hundred dollars almost in the bag and in the tank. Done nothing. So but <clears throat> just to take a quick look if you're going from plant population here, and I do this to, to help you see what I'm talking about. Going from twenty five thousand to sixty five thousand Okay, if you have an 80K bag, it'll go from planting 3.2 acres down to planting 1.2. If that bag costs $300, the 25,000 costs you 9375. 65,000 costs you 243.75. Let's say that bag's 350. That's 284 dollars just in seed in the bag. Okay, so but we're looking at that fertilizer cost. Same thing, you know, 240. Looking at $200 a ton, 250 300 350 I remember the days when nitrogen was a nickel. And I know some of you, because I can tell by looking, because this stuff up here, you know, it didn't get that way. Um, farming well every time you take risk. But anyway, you can see, so if you're at 320, 65,284 plus 175, that's a lot of money. But can we hit 450 bushels? Not if Mother Nature doesn't cooperate. So the, the study that I really want to talk about is this a brand new study. We're, you know, we've, we've looked at, at, at inputs all kinds of ways, fungicides, more fertilizer, nitrogen, sulfur, zinc. Okay, what happens if you do all these kind of things? You start adding them. So this study is on a, it's on a commerce. It's, good, it's a good, I'm, I'm following soybeans. I'm following USDA soybeans. So, um, this was last year was the first year. I'm going to do it again this year, but it's on a Commerce Silt Clay Loam, Commerce Newton. It's silt loam to silt clay loam. Good soil, good yield potential. We're going to look at both single row and twin rows, and we're looking at 32,000 versus 40,000 seed per acre in the whole plots. And then we got a series here where we, we up the end rates from 210 to, two, to 280, and then we start adding things. Okay. System three, we're going to add 40 pounds of P and 100 pounds of K. System four, we're going to add that plus 20 pounds of sulfur. System five, we're going to add all that plus 10 pounds of zinc. And number six, we're going to add all of that plus the fungicide application. Now, the things that I'm including here are things that producers do without checking. Okay, I, I, I'm not going to scout. I'm just going to make a fungicide application. Well, that costs money. So the other thing that I have done is taken the same system I put it all out there to start with, then I start removing stuff. So uh, this is called addition and deletions. So I start taking things out of that system. So now we're going to take a look at, at what happened. Now again, this is first year data. So the way this sets up, you've got single row 32,000 plants per acre. You've got single row 40,000 plants per acre. Twin row 32,000 plants per acre and twin row 40,000. These are my big plants. And so these are averaged across all of those other inputs you saw, the other six systems. We averaged across those, we averaged across replications. And the thing that's real obvious real quick, okay, when you've got A's and B's, okay, A is different from B. So at the 32,000, on single rows, going from 32,000 <coughs> up to 30, up to 40,000, we increased yields here about 15 bushels per acre by, by planting more seed. Now, depending on the cost of corn, if corn was seven dollars, you know you can figure that you you can figure these kind of things out. So, but going from single row thirty-two to going to twin row thirty-two, in this case, we only got about three bushels. So, the twin row system didn't really give us anything, but it, it but it didn't cost us anything. And so, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay, going from forty single row forty to twin row forties again, we don't see much difference this there. Uh, this is bushel test weight. There's some variation here. One of the things that's interesting when we went to twin row Twin row 40k we actually saw a decrease in the seed size But the yields aren't any different. So we saw a little bit smaller and what happens, you know Those ears are down a little bit. So now whether that will happen again. I don't know. You know, we're this is only one year data But if we just look at the planning patterns this year we didn't see any difference in yield between the planting patterns, but we did see a difference in bushel weight. And these are pretty good bushel weights for most of the country. You know, if you if you were in central Illinois and you got a bushel weight above 55, 
you're doing awesome. In the south, we tend to have more dense grain, and so we have a little bit better bushel weights, and then the seed weights, we saw the, you know, when we went to Twin Row, we saw, and I'm not sure why, we don't always see this difference right here, but the seeding rates, we did see that significant increase. Okay, let's look at the, the subplots, what I call the sub-treatments here. No differences. Range is from 225. There's a, you know, you send, the more you do, you seem to have actually decreased yields, but, but statistically, there's no difference. But every one of these inputs added cost. So if you're out there, well, I'm going to stand a little extra fertilizer. Costs money. I'm going to add a little nitrogen, or a little bit of sulfur. Costs money. I'm going to add a fungicide. Costs money. But it didn't did it give us any yield. No, it did not give us any yield. Okay. Okay. Well, I did this from low to high. Now, what happens if I decide to go in here? I'm going to do this the other way. So I'm, just, I'm sorting out my options here. So <clears throat> this is the same system, only I added everything and started taking things away. So again, we still have the same difference here. Now this is in the same field. The first test is the first four reps. The next test is the next four reps going across the field. So it's in the same field, managed the same way, planted the same day, fertilized the same time, watered the same time. So same field, but we do see a little bit of differences here. Now, the twin row 40s again, this is our highest yield. But now, you do see a significant difference in this test. Now, these are average across all those other treatments. So, we did see a difference here between the 40K twin row versus 40K single row. We had an advantage. And we saw a lot this year advantages to twin rows over single rows on corn this year. Last year, we didn't see that, but we did this year. If we look at the, the overall see, twin rows, it gave us about... Um, six or seven bushels per acre, higher yields, average across everything else, single row versus twin rows. Um, so that we don't see that all the time. Last year there was no difference in some of the other tests. This year we saw a significant difference. But the plant populations in this particular case, now the variety here is uh, Pioneer 1870 was the variety here. So it's, it's one of Pioneer's newer varieties, real good variety, responds to high fertility and stuff. But, you know, we, do, we did see an advantage to twin rows. We're back to that comparison of all those additional inputs. You don't see any red letters here. There's no red letters here and it's not significant. So all those things we did that added money, every time we took away a little bit of input, it didn't help us any. So, you know, the yields are a little bit better in this test, but there's no differences. So all that money I spent cost me money. Yes, sir? So that's all the twin rows and the different... See, this is average across right. twin rows and the plant populations. So, yeah, this is average across those other inputs. Right. So, you know, you know, in previous studies we've shown the cotton yields <coughs> increase with no additional inputs, that rotation effect. And I've got now about over 20 years worth of rotation work that shows the response. Now there are times when we do, we can get a decrease in yield. With, if you take a situation where, and this has happened to us back in, uh, I don't remember now, 2004, 2006, I think. If you get a, the thing that generally happens with cotton following corn, you get a good root system, you get big plants, in July, it looks great. It rains the last half of July and all of August. What happens to bowl rot? Everywhere. What happens to yield? It goes down. So what looked great to start with on cotton gave us a problem. Now, it helped soybeans, it helped corn, but it didn't help cotton. So we actually, and again, I don't have Mother Nature in my pocket. She doesn't tell me everything. So I didn't know we were going to get 10 inches of rain in August last year. She just didn't tell me that. So, you know, there are possibilities of decreasing yields. You know, we've shown significant responses to increasing seeding rates in 20 rows, but not always. There's sometimes it doesn't work. But overall, it does. Uh, and both of these addition and deletion studies, you know, when we increased, um, 
we saw significant yield advantages. Now, it's the first year, and you get in a pile of trouble. So I might be back next year saying none of that stuff I told you last year was true. <laughs> That's what happened with one-year data. But a farmer might take it and run with it. So just, just to be looking at that. You know, the whole plot effect, you know, the seeding rate and stuff, um, the seeding rates were more important this particular year than whether it was single row or twin row. Um, the additions of more more nitrogen. Okay, what does it, if I add more nitrogen and I didn't get a response, what's that tell me? Nitrogen's not my problem. That's not my limiting factor. I added more P and K. Didn't get any response, okay? To get a response, I need to have a problem. Well, if I don't have a problem, if I got high P and K, then adding more, you know, if you've got a million bucks in the bank, adding 10 bucks, now you got a million 10. Can you tell the difference in the interest at the end of the month? No. So you might as well take some out of the bank. If you took 10 bucks out of that million, or 100 or 1,000, at the end of the month, the interest may still be the same. So start taking some out of the bank. Um, that means the factors aren't, you know, right now the markets have gotten a lot tougher than they used to be. Farming is a challenge. But no producer has control over Mother Nature. Um, you know, rotation effects, they are real. They've been real. You know, we were in monocrop cotton for a long time. And I know I had a phone call the other day from a farmer that's been in continuous corn forever. He says he makes money at it. I believe him. It scares me, though. But, the, but he's making money at it. Because of nematodes, pathogens. Uh, same way with the guys doing... Uh, you know, uh, cover crops, uh, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of vegetation on the surface in the spring. If it rains, what happens? Doesn't dry out. So, what you're looking for may not always happen because Mother Nature won't cooperate. Uh, what, what the best thing to do is to follow sound production practice, tried and true. Snake oils don't work. They never have worked. I'm not going to ask how many people have bought snake oil before, but I know all of you know what I'm talking about. You know, soil test. Best tool you have, know what you have in the field. You know, if you've got a potash level of 900, forget putting potash out there. No matter what anybody tells you, where the, the guy selling fertilizer wants you, he don't make money if you don't buy fertilizer. Guys selling fungicide don't make money if you don't buy fungicide. A guy buying snake oil or selling snake oil doesn't make any money unless you buy some. So just keep that in mind. Follow sound practices market wisely. Now that's a big statement right there. Market wise. That's a tough situation. Um, and always be sure to ask questions. So with that, I'm gonna stop. I'll if we got any if you have any questions, you know, please be sure to ask. Yes, sir. Did your soil test show a need for PK sulfur and zinc? No. So let's say these are situations where I'm doing it and not soil test. I know it didn't need them. But see, some people say, well, if I put a little bit more, that's, that's better. No. Man. You put a little more whiskey in the glass, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I want company time. I didn't say that. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to change courses now. Like I say, I, I indicated earlier that <clears throat> I was on Chico's granddaddy's farm a long time ago. Chico wasn't very old back then. Uh, he's older today than he